taking some time during your summers to be part of this program. I think that's showing, you know, that you guys are very dedicated yourselves. You're demonstrating an interest in medicine and in neurosurgery and things like that. So give yourselves a pat on the back as well. So with this presentation, what I really wanna do is kind of two things. First, I'm gonna talk um, a little bit about myself and my journey to how I got to medical school, but at the same time, like sprinkle in some things, some tips that might help you like become a better applicant, um, things that you should maybe be aware of as you go through college, the pre-med process or the pre-health process. Um, and then I'll give you a little taste into what medical school actually is like, like um, for a first year or second year student during, during their initial um, few years. So that's kind of the agenda for today. Um, I don't know if any of you guys know this movie on the left. It's one of my favorite movies, Journey to the Center of the Earth. But I kind of compare Journey to Medical School in a similar way. It's like sometimes it can be a very unknown path where you're not really sure of where you're going and like things are unclear. Um, there are difficulties you're going to encounter. It's not, not a very straight route for a lot of students. That's just something to keep in mind. So that's a very important part. Alrighty, so moving on. I think it's good to give you guys a little bit of a roadmap first of sort of how the journey to becoming an actual doctor works. Um, so I guess, you know, you guys are probably a mix of high school and undergraduate students. Um, once you get to college, students typically tend to take something called the pre-med track. So there's sometimes a little confusion between what pre-med versus like what a major is. And I can address more of that. Um, Pre-med is basically where you're taking a series or a set of required courses that med schools want to see you take. So this is going to include like the sciences, chemistry, physics, um, biology, obviously, math, and then also maybe like an English and like maybe some social or behavioral sciences. You can always go to the, the websites of these med schools and they can literally tell you exactly what requirements you need. So pre-med, the undergraduate course will typically be like four years for most students. Some students go straight through. So they'll, I guess like in Ashley's case as well, and also in my case, um, we applied directly in the fall of like, or the summer of our senior year of college, um, setting ourselves up for matriculation into medical school the following year. Um, that is not the norm for everyone because there are students that choose to take gap years. And that's a very normal thing to do. Some students feel like they wanna explore something else or they, they want some time off before applying perfectly normal. Um, you can certainly explore that option. And then they apply to medical school following those gap years. And then there's also another series of students that don't take pre-med courses during their undergrad. Like perhaps they were more into like another course of study, like English, for example, um, and they need to fulfill those required classes first. What they can do is take a post back following graduation, and then they can satisfy those requirements there. So those are three different options, but like three different routes you can get to medical school. Once you get into medical school, then you have four years of study. The first two years you're doing a lot of it in the classroom and you're learning the foundations of medicine. And then you take something called the USMLE step one. So I'm sure you guys heard about the MCAT, but this is basically like, sort of like the MCAT for med students where everyone has to take this and the interesting thing is you guys might have heard, it used to be um, scored. So the score would be an important part of your residency application. But for my class going forward, it's actually turned to pass fail. So that's been an interesting change that they've kind of done to help with students' mental health and things like that. Um, it's still a little controversial about if students really wanted pass, um, pass fail or not, but that seems to be the way that things have changed. So then you go through your years three and four. I'll talk about this a little more, but in these years, you're now becoming more of like an actual doctor because you're actually working in the hospitals and you're responsible for actual patients. Um, so in my opinion, it gets a little more interesting in the third and fourth years because you're really getting more patient responsibility and you really start to feel like you're more of a doctor. Um, there's more USMLE tests. I'm sorry, guys, medicine is a lot of tests and that's just kind of the way it is. Um, and then finally, once you graduate, yeah, you're a doctor, you got your MD, you go into internship. And 
you might hear that word tossed around a lot. That's basically your first year of residency where um, you have like a, a wide variety of things that you're sort of rotating in. You're getting a really broad spectrum of like different types of medicine and specialties. And, you know, it can help you sort of narrow things down. Um, and then what, you know, once you specifically kind of choose what you want to do, there's so many different specialties in medicine. You can, you can start to um, do residency later on and there you're really getting your full-fledged training. Um, you can do a fellowship after, and then you finally, you know, get board certified and then congratulations, you're an attending doctor. And I think you guys will have more talks later on from actual doctors that maybe can speak to this process that they went through. <clears throat> so since I'm kind of fresh out and like the, the application cycle was very like recent to me, I think it's, it'll be good to like show you guys kind of some of the factors that helped me get through the process and then what like drove me to go to medical school. Um, so this question will come up so many times on the interview trail and it's very important to kind of like keep thinking about why you wanted to go into medicine in the first place. Um, I, I thought about it last night and then I kind of whittled it down to three different like reasons. So I listed them here. Curiosity for science. I think the human body is just amazing. I think, you know, I, there's no better thing than to like have a job that like helps you discover more and more about the human body, which obviously we probably still have like barely scratched the surface. So I think it's so cool that doctors get to explore that more. I like to be in the presence of people. And I think that was one of the ways in which I narrowed down if I wanted to do medicine versus research. I really liked research in undergrad. I'll talk about that more again. Um, but I also sort of realized that working in a lab, in a wet lab, um, where I necessarily didn't have face-to-face -face contact that often, um, comparatively to when I was like working in the hospital, when you're constantly like working with teams and you're always talking with other people and you're trying to solve problems together. I think that was a huge factor for me in like choosing medicine eventually. And then finally the constant drive for innovation. So like research is a big part of medicine and I was really attracted to the fact that I could help advance this like field of knowledge and um, really become a doctor who is involved in the development of like medical technologies and can essentially be a part of the future solutions. So maybe that sounds a little cliche, but I really believe in that. And I think a lot of you guys, okay, I see Ashley shaking her head. Um, I, 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 can, I know a lot of you guys probably also have that in mind um, that you, know, you wanna make big scale changes going forward. Okay, so I'll get a little bit more into like what I did in college. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania. I graduated in 2020 um, and I chose to study biochemistry predominantly. So I chose a very, very heavy science, science-y track. Um, I, I, I wanted this because I knew that, you know, getting into medical school and medical school eventually would require me to have a good foundation of knowledge. Um, so I actually elected for biochemistry over something like neurobiology, which, which was offered at my school as a major because of the fact that I wanted a really like wide base of science background. Like I wanted to be good at chemistry. I wanted to be good at physics. And I think that was very like valuable for me. Um, it was definitely challenging. Biochemistry is not an easy major, probably at most, most undergraduate schools. Um, so it really pushed me to like try my best and sort of really deal with any challenges that came my way. Um, and I think it was pretty rewarding because it prepared me well for medical school. I also elected to take a minor. Um, and some of you guys maybe might be confused about like what a major and a minor is. So in college, they're gonna ask you to choose a major course of study where you have a series of classes. Um, I, I forgot the exact course amount, um, but it might be around the, sort of around like 15, 16 credits or something like that, where you're taking a bunch of classes that are sort of grouped together and you're forming like your path of study. So biochemistry was my major. And I also elected to take a minor, which I think was six classes. So it's significantly a lower amount of classes that you have to satisfy. Um, and I wanted to do something in like more of the like humanities type of field. And um, at Penn, basically, they offered something called a bioethics minor, which was, which was pretty awesome because it gave me the chance to check out some other really cool areas um, that they were offering classes in. So for example, anthropology, like actual bioethics, um, there was a class, there were a couple of classes on the history of medicine. So kind of how did like medical innovations and devices and science and technology change over time. I think that gave me like a very good perspective 
into the fact that medicine is always changing, like I said before. Um, so those, those are the two primary things that I did um, for my major and my minor. And to sort of address what like pre-med is, pre-med again, as I said before, it's a series of required classes that you have to fulfill. And luckily for me, the biochemistry major addressed a lot of these pre-med classes. So, you, okay, so I'll go to the next slide. Yeah, so you might see a chart like this if you look up like common majors among pre-meds. And this is generally what you'll find is that, yeah, the majority do elect for science-y majors. And a lot of times that's easier because of the fact that you have significant overlap between the major courses and your pre-med requirements. So like your general biology, your general chemistry, your general physics, that stuff will all be satisfied. Um, however, I do wanna mention for those of you in the webinar that are interested in other stuff, that is perfectly okay. And I think that's actually really awesome because college is the time for you to explore your passions. Um, you can see here, right? There are some people that elected for like artsy majors, um, maybe like other sort of like public health or health administration, bioengineering, which I, in my opinion, I think bioengineering is a rising uh, major among pre-meds. I actually ask a lot of people and I feel like bioe comes up a lot. So some people really like that, getting more like hands-on, um, applicable with their study. Engineering can offer you that. It's difficult, but it's definitely an option. Um, and then also like psychology, maybe econ business, um, education. These are all totally valid pretty much any major is valid is a valid major that you could take. Um, but remember, if you want to be pre-med and you still want to be on the pre-med track, you do still have to find time to add those courses to your list. So you may have to take more courses um, during the year, maybe take a summer session or something like that, if you choose to do a non-science major. So just letting you guys know. Last point, I think it's important to address. Challenging yourself is generally Terrific. I think it's college can be a definitely a time to challenge yourself and medical schools often say that, you know, if you took a harder course load, you know, it's going to be like, sort of like, um, like a medal on your, your, your coat because, you know, you challenged yourself, you didn't take the easy way out. But I will also like to qualify that statement by saying like, make sure you can handle it, given your um, other responsibilities, extracurricular activities, um, whatever else, family, friends, personal life. It's important that you don't lose sight of that because oftentimes students can get into a spiral and I'll talk about my own challenges later on, but it's easy to get into a spiral where you know, you're so focused on maintaining like six or seven credits. Um, you're trying to do your best to be on the pre-med schedule, but you're also doing like another major and you have research to deal with and it, it gets really tough. And then you know, it's easy to get stressed and fall into a thing where like you start thinking like, oh shoot, like am I, am I not cut out for this? Um, so definitely take whatever sort of plate you can, you can fill, um, but don't stretch yourself too thin where it's compromising your mental health and um, your other personal life. Okay, so um, I'll talk about some of the bigger things that sort of drove me again in undergrad to pursue medicine and a little bit more about sort of my journey there. Uh, research was huge for me. So I worked in a neuroscience lab that also dealt with molecular biology. Um, so what we were doing is essentially my, my projects were investigating the role of like certain transcription factors. If you guys have taken biology, maybe these terms sound familiar. Um, if not, it's okay as well. You can always ask me later or like reach out to me afterwards. Um, and we, we ran a bunch of um, psychiatric sort of based experiments where we would administer chronic stress paradigms to mice. And maybe that sounds a little mean. Maybe it's a little mean, sure. But um, I tr trust me, we got grants for this and the NIH or whoever, whatever body was okay with it. Um, so we would run a series of like chronic stress or fear conditioning, um, as well as like drug addiction studies. And we would check and see like if certain genes in the mouse were like upregulated or did, they, did their expression change based on this. And we would try to identify the link between the molecular side of things as well as like the behavioral side of things. So this is kind of what I did for four years. Um, and there was a lab actually in Mount Sinai that I worked at before, um, before college where I, I made a connection with someone and then they moved to my undergraduate school. I was able to get it through that. Um, and so I, I've been, I was doing that for four years. Um, I eventually did like a senior project, which was awesome. And I, I was a little more independent with that. I would really encourage if you guys are doing research at your home institutions to 
ask your PIs about opportunities for being more independent and maybe trying to like get an abstract or like starting maybe like a smaller project. I think it's really valuable because you start to develop certain skills that carry you forward um, through your entire training. And I think it's, it's a super valuable experience to have. Um, and I think, let me just add like a word on research. So, so this is probably more for like the high school students too that are probably wondering about like, what do I, how do I get involved in research if it's not very clear in college? Um, there are a few ways that you can go about it. I think the most common one is probably to just cold email professors. So if you go on your school's website, there might be like a research tab that you can find. And you should be able, maybe if there's like a database, I know there was one for my school where there was a database and you could search keywords and depending on what you're interested in, you could try to find professors that basically were doing that kind of work. Um, otherwise, again, Cold emailing works, but make sure you sort of email it to a lot of people because professors are busy. That's just the reality of it. I mean, not just professors, but even now in medical school, I know like doctors also as well. Um, so you will probably have to reach out to a lot of people and then maybe you'll get like a few hits back. And then from there you can like maybe interview or meet them and see if like you're a good fit for the lab and they can see if you're a good fit. Um, and that's kind of like a way to do it. Otherwise, you can probably check and see at your maybe like your clubs, like your pre your pre med clubs, or if there's any other interest groups at your school. I would recommend that because sometimes like speakers can come, um, and you can eventually make a make a, a contact that way. So it's kind of like a little networking thing. Um, I know for medical school actually that's pretty that's pretty useful because we do get like I mean this is more like true pre COVID because now with COVID it's, everything's virtual and it's kind of harder to do this, but Speakers often come to medical schools and like physici physicians that are doing research and you can literally like attend their talk or attend the club activity. And then afterwards, just stop by and say like, hi, my name is so-and-so and, -so, and I'm, I'm really interested in what you're doing. Um, and then like shoot them an email and, and ask if maybe you can participate on like a project with them. Um, so I think it's actually even easier in medical school because you get more face-to-face -face time with these um, physicians. Um, but that's generally, I think, ways of going about it. Um, there's probably more, but definitely just like keep your eyes open for opportunities in your college or your undergraduate school. So I, again, this is also kind of like a point of confusion. I know I was like pretty confused on like different types of research when I was in college. Um, so you have basically like maybe like three broad categories that I'd like to like characterize them into. You have your basic science um, and that's what I did pretty much in, in college. And with your basic research, you, you guys can kind of think about it in terms of like being on a bench um, and you're like pipetting stuff. I know that's just like the typical image that you might have in your head, um, but it's basically more along the lines of like you're doing more like broader things where you're really working with the molecular side. Um, and there's this another step that you have to take to kind of, as you can see in the translation part, bench to bedside, right? So to make it more directly clinical to patients. So with basic, you might be working with other models, maybe like cell lines or mice or monkeys or some like other type of, of model that's not directly human. And I think it's important to address that like basic research is the crux of all research because we need to have these findings in other like animals and other systems before we have enough evidence for it to eventually transition into clinical or translational um, and eventual clinical trials. So basic science is like a huge aspect. Um, and the reality is that you can certainly as an undergraduate get involved with basic research, but be aware that basic research takes more time. Um, you're probably gonna be running more experiments, right? Which then obviously leads to the chances of them maybe not working as well as you hoped and you have to repeat it. So it's a time consuming process, highly rewarding, I would say, um, but more time consuming. So if you're looking in terms of like maybe publishing your work, um, you may want to be a part of that research for a longer amount of time, or you may want to budget more time into it. Um, that's just pretty much a fact. And I would say, so translational research was, my, my lab also kind of dabbled in translational too. That's more of like the idea that whatever you kind of discover in the bench, you're sort of bridging it um, to eventually study it in patients um, and get to more of the clinical side. 
So I think a, a big area where that's relevant is like with like drug design. So basic, you can sort of test and see these different molecules and how it like works in like the mouse brain, for example. Um, but with translational, you're probably gonna be doing a little more about like, okay, like how do I take this product and now apply it more to the humans, human side, um, eventually leading to like a clinical trial, for example. So that's also a very important like bridging point between the two. And then clinical research, now we're talking directly with like the human population pretty much. And we're trying to see how our studies affect humans. Um, so I'm currently doing clinical research um, this summer actually with a neurosurgeon. And because you guys are in the Brain Turns uh, podcast, I think it'd be nice for me to maybe go a little more into that, um, which I'll do so later when I talk about medical school. Um, but the, the sort of the differences I've noticed so far are that clinical research is less time consuming. Um, I've pretty much so far just been going through patient data. Um, so yeah, it's definitely less time consuming, it's quicker. Um, maybe for some, it might be not as interesting because you're not directly like running experiments. If that's what really fuels you, I would say that like basic might be for you. Um, but clinical, I think I've liked so far that I've been able to like learn more about like neurosurgery. And again, I'll talk more about it, but it's about this thing called vagus nerve stimulators. And I'm very interested in that. And I've been able to learn more about the procedures. I've been looking at my surgeon's operative notes. Um, and I've been really learning more about these different procedures and the different patient outcomes. Um, and it's nice now that I'm actually able to like see the patients and sort of paint this picture in my head of like who they are and get more clinical data, more social data on them. And it really makes me feel more of like a humane like researcher in a way. Um, last point I'll address on this is that a lot of times students also like they fall in love with research and you know definitely explore, talk to your maybe friends or colleagues that have chosen the PhD route as well. Um, that's also another option if you really want to stick to doing full-time basic research, um, doing a PhD in a field can definitely be a rewarding experience. And on top of that, there's also something now called an MD PhD program, or I mean, it's been, a while, it's been around for a while, but that is again, as you can imagine, it's a longer course of study where you're getting educated in both the, like the medical degree, so you're getting the medical side of it, um, as well as the research component of the PhD. So students tend to come out of that um, being very, very well versed in whatever field they're studying. And they're, they're usually very attractive candidates for, for residency. Um, so I, I elected just to do MD and I can answer more questions about maybe why I chose that as opposed to a PhD or an MD PhD. Um, and I don't, I don't think any of the other speakers from my school, actually, oh, there is one who is an MD PhD. His name is Janos. Um, so I think when he's talking, you guys can certainly ask more questions related to that because I know he'd love to talk, talk to you about that. So um, volunteering and mentoring, some other very important components, I think, of what drove me into medicine. Um, so as I mentioned before, research was definitely like high on my list of sort of things that like I wanted to continue. And I briefly thought about like, hmm, what if I did consider like an MD, PhD? And I think what really drove me to go more towards the like the medical, the clinical side was like my experiences volunteering um, at my local hospital. So at the, this is at the Penn Presbyterian Medical Center in Philadelphia. I was responsible for basically going and talking to geriatric or older patients um, that oftentimes had very little family with them. And these are a lot of patients that had suffered like orthopedic traumas. So they've fallen in the bathroom or, um, they had some sort of weakness where they were they were not very like mobile. They couldn't really move around or they were in like a wheelchair. And I would be able to go into the ward and just talk to them, maybe like, oh, excuse the, the there's a fire department nearby. So if you hear that, I was able to go and talk to them, um, maybe play games with them, do crossword puzzles, something like that. And it would really help them, I think, get a little more company and feel less lonely. So again, it was a very simple way for me to go in and I was learning more about like how like sort of the, the hospital worked and like I was observing a lot and that was kind of valuable, but it was just so great to finally get a chance to have direct patient time. And medical schools really do want to see that you've had experiences where you've had direct patient contact. Um, and that doesn't just have to be working at a hospital. It can be, it can be a variety of other things. Some students want to, want to get EMT certified and they have direct patient contact that way on like very thrilling ambulance runs. 
Um, others remain like choose to do a hospital thing or there could be a bunch of different areas you can explore. But I think it's important um, to know that they will ask you when you apply um, what kinds of direct patient experiences have you had. And I think it's great because you also get great stories out of them too. So you can definitely recount some, some, some stories or anecdotes that you've had that sort of solidified or cemented your decision to go into medicine. The mentoring aspect, um, one thing I'm really passionate about is sort of working with like younger kids. So for example, like with you guys, uh, even though I know I, I worked with um, like middle schoolers. So it was really fun because I would go there and I would like teach science to them and I would teach, I would help teach like math. Um, and that was great because it was just another way of like sort of giving back to like my local community. So I would encourage you guys, if you have hobbies or, or sort of side things that you're interested in, in ways to give back to the community, um, definitely go through with it. Um, try to find time if you can. Sometimes it's not always possible because again, you guys are always, you know, it's, we have to do so much as pre-meds to really like prepare ourselves. But um, if you can find time to like explore your passions, I would definitely recommend you guys try to do it. Okay, so this is a really important, this is probably like the main message that I wanna get out of this talk right now. Um, because med applying to medical school is, is difficult. Um, I want to like demystify that it's like a very easy process that like you guys are going to breeze through. I mean, maybe like some of you will, but some of you like me will probably encounter some difficulties that you have to address. So just to give you guys a sense of, so on the right, this is just a rundown of like some of the requirements that they ask for. So you can see, right, you have to have an undergraduate degree, you have to take your medical prereqs, you need clinical experience, research experience, um, I would say you, you can get, I don't think it's if for, for an MD only program, um, it's as mandatory perhaps, perhaps for an MD PhD, it's more required. Um, but a lot of students elect, elect to get research experience, um, but I wouldn't say it's mandatory. Volunteering experience, as I mentioned before, direct patient contact, that is very important. Um, you'll need letters of recommendation. So it's generally three. Um, I'm gonna revise what they're saying here a little bit. So generally, it's gonna be from one or maybe two science faculty. That's generally um, something that schools recommend. And this is again, it varies school by school. So you're gonna to have to actually look at the schools you're applying to, to get the exact um, requirements for these letters. Um, the where it says at least one from a medical doctor, I'm not so sure that's true maybe anymore because I didn't really have any schools, I think except for one that I applied to that required a letter from a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare provider. So I generally do not do not think that's true. So just keep that in mind. Um, after you submit something called the primary application where you submit sort of all of your like general essays and you eventually select which schools you wanna to go to and you put your MCAT score on there. Um, once you submit that sometime around June, um, in July, you'll start receiving a bulk of things called secondary applications. I can say Ashley, like nodding your head because you're going through this too, right? Um, and secondaries are going to be school specific. So this is a very intense process where you're actually like um, going to want to go into the school's like website and you're going to want to do a little more research maybe to say why exactly these specific schools that you apply to stand out to you. Um, and it comes in like waves. Like it, I remember last year, it came really fast and I remember feeling like pretty overwhelmed um, but really, I would plan, I would ask you guys, like, try to organize yourselves and, like, definitely try to, like, do a bunch a day that you're not leaving it all to the end. So the other components, obviously, that are very important, GPA, very important to try to maintain your grades to the highest you can, as well as the MCAT, which um, perhaps you guys will have maybe more um, sessions on this. But again, it's the major standardized test that you have to take. It's the medical college admissions test. And that's gonna be like the huge test that you're gonna to wanna to really devote a lot of time for, prepare for, because you wanna get the best score you can. Um, and then finally Casper, I don't know if this is a newer thing or not, but essentially what Casper is, I did it like online where it gives you a series of ethical scenarios and it asks you to like type in responses to them. Um, I think it's like a newer feature, not all schools require, require it, but some do. And it's, it's really not that stressful. Um, I don't know exactly how much it gets factored into the application process, but there are websites and resources that can give you like sample questions if you want to practice. So some challenges that I faced um, 
I definitely want to be like very honest and true about this because there's a lot of um, people here I can see. So I'm sure that I'm not alone in going through these. Um, but I just wanted to like describe them and discuss them with you guys. Oh, freshman year of college um, was a rough transition point for me um, because there were so many things to balance like extracurriculars and social life um, and as well as sort of realizing that the tests got a lot harder for me, especially because I like overwhelmed myself with a lot of science classes. I think that was kind of an inflection point for me because um, I was struggling to maintain my GPA and I was worried about the fact that maybe I wouldn't be as competitive for medical school as I hoped. Um, so what I ended up doing was reaching out to some mentors and advisors, and they kind of told me just like maybe relax your course load a little bit um, and, and try your best for sophomore year. So I ended up actually having to reduce some of the extracurriculars that I was doing um, to focus more on my academics. Um, I changed sort of the way that I was going about studying. So I was spending more time devoting time to preparing before tests. I changed kind of like the way I organized my notes. Um, I tried to sit more in the front of the classroom so I could like be more engaged and attentive. And these changes helped because I did much better sophomore year. And that kind of gave me this, like the, the confidence to go forward and like really thinking that I was cut out for this and I was ready to apply for medical school. Um, stress and anxiety related to the MCAT. The MCAT can be a very stressful process um, because Generally, it's recommended that you take at least like two to three months to study. Some people take more, that's perfectly fine. Um, but it's, it's hard sometimes to sometimes stick to schedule to the schedules that you set out for yourselves and like really maintain yourselves on, on this path. Because again, the MCAT, it's a very long exam. It requires and tests a lot of different knowledge that you will accumulate from your undergraduate courses. Um, and it really will, will drain you. Um, but I think it's important to note that that's totally normal um, and it's, it's a normal process and don't be afraid to reach out to family and friends if you feel like you're struggling with it and you want an extra set, an, another voice to, to hear from and encourage you. And then finally, comparison to peers. I know this is a, a common point that students um, bring up about like pre-med and that it can be a little cutthroat. Um, sometimes you can feel that people are only trying to worry about themselves and they're really like not, not, they don't care about other people and they're only trying to improve their own scores and stuff like that. Um, so I think one thing you can try to do is sort of work on not like inherently comparing yourself to people. I know I used to do that a fair amount and I've, I've like kind of like tried to stop that um, because it, it gets tough. You know, you'll have peers that are really like taking seven classes and um, stretching themselves thin with like research and extracurriculars, um, but everyone does it at their own pace. Everyone has their own way of doing it. There is not one way that's the right way. Um, so really focus on that and just only try to like worry about like what you're doing and you'll be fine. Um, and then I just wanna throw a little more positive slide on there. You are not alone. You have so many uh, resources that you can reach out to, family, friends, counselors, mentors. Um, don't be afraid to reach out. It, you know, it doesn't show that you're weak or anything. In fact, I think it shows that you're stronger, that you're like taking the initiatives to reach out um, if you need it. And don't be afraid to take days to like improve your mental health. This is especially true, I think, when you're studying for the MCAT. I think it's a great idea to maybe take a day off or to do something you like, if that's, you know, going outside or doing yoga or relaxing or watching sports. Do that. Like I think that's that's so important because you need, you'll need days to recharge and to refresh. Um, forums. I think this is another point that's brought up a lot. Um, Pre-med forums can be a really valuable source of information. So I know I'm talking about like you know like SDN and Reddit and those things. I was on it too. Like I won't lie. Um, I try to go on there to get information as well. But sometimes it's easy to get lost in like other people like posting about themselves and about their stats or their scores that happens and it may make you feel bad right because like i said it's hard for humans as, as humans like we inherently compare ourselves sometimes and it's easy to get lost in that rabbit hole of doing that and i would encourage everyone you know if you're looking if you're going to the forums like look for information or, look, or maybe ask a question specifically but don't get caught in a rabbit hole of like scrolling down to like a chance me thread or something where you know, sometimes you might feel a little bit bad about like people that have done very well. So that's another side tip. 
So for the MCAT, um, just some basic tips. I'm not gonna go into it a whole lot, but planning is the key here. I think you really wanna build a schedule. You wanna stick to it. Um, you wanna be realistic about your scheduling. So, you know, if you're someone that, let's say like you're a night person and you don't like waking up early, like don't set a schedule like you're gonna be waking up at like 6 a.m. every day if it's not realistic enough. Cause then if you don't meet it, you're probably gonna be feeling worse about it. So try to build a realistic one, I would say. Um, resources, they can be expensive. I'm not gonna lie. Um, I'm someone who like, I, I really like try to get a lot of resources to study, um, but I think I could have done a better job in looking for discounts. So maybe if you, if you follow some of these test prep companies like Kaplan or Princeton Review, um, they have discounts oftentimes. So if you, if you follow them on Instagram or Facebook and you can like watch out for those, that might be very helpful. Kaplan as well, um, that, that could be a good option. Um, but I would say definitely purchase any like AMC official materials. You'll want to purchase those because those are as true to the actual MCAT as possible. So I think they also offer um, a series of tests, of practice tests. You're going to want to definitely get that as well as to strategically um, plan when you want to take those practice tests. Finally, again, I can't emphasize like the mental health well-being enough. Get time to relax exercise, eat, sleep normally. Um, it should not be at the sacrifice of your, your personal health or your mental health and happiness. Um, because if it is, then I think it's really an, like, an impetus for you to reach out uh, to, to your support systems. Um, this is again, a very stressful process, but definitely prioritize yourself first. And then I think I mentioned this before, um, application process. Okay, great. So. Um, it is 938. So I'm going to give like a quick little 10 minute rundown on, on medical school and what I've experienced so far. So you guys get a little taste of it. Um, but I'm very excited to do this because in a way, like I'm also advertising our school, which I'm kind of happy to do because I love my school. And like, I think it's, it's a really great innovative school. So the way our curriculum works, and this is probably generally true for most medical schools is we have our first two years where, as I said before, you're building your clinical knowledge in the classroom. Um, and you're really like learning the basic foundations of medical sciences. Um, so our, our school kind of does it more by body system where um, we, we organize the weeks thematically by whatever body system we're looking at. So for example, this past block that we just finished, it was called homeostasis because maybe you can imagine what three organs I'm talking about, but it's the heart, the lungs, and the kidneys, which are vital in maintaining homeostasis for our bodies. Um, those were the three emphasized systems. And our, all our weeks were set up to kind of talk about that and learn more about that. Um, I'll talk more about this once a week clinical rotation later. Uh, and then we finally have your second two years in, as an MS3 or an MS4, uh, where you have now direct clinical responsibilities that are basically the way for students to start preparing themselves for residency, for, for being an independent physician. And it's a really great way to kind of see like how much you've learned over the first two years and now apply it to real life patients that you're gonna encounter. Um, and I believe there's an MS3 who will be talking to you guys. So she's gonna probably address more of what she's doing as a third year. So this is a sample schedule, I wonder, which I wonder what you guys actually thought a medical student's schedule would be. Maybe you can, you can put it in the chat if you guys thought we'd be in class like all day. Um, but that's actually not true. Yeah, which is great because otherwise that would, that would stink. Um, we're actually in class pretty much in the mornings, but we get out like by 12, one o'clock. So we have time to do other outside interests, um, shadow, volunteer, things like that, which is, which is terrific, um, as well as study and prepare for whatever else we have for that week. So this is a sample schedule. Um, you can see here that Monday, Wednesdays, and, and Fridays, we have something called, you see the Pearl small group. That is the primary way in which we learn our information is through small group sessions, um, which is awesome because I think as me, for me, like I'm not someone who like prefers necessarily the large group PowerPoint structure that you'll probably encounter in your undergraduate bigger science classes. Um, but medical school really turned things on its head for me where now we're literally in a small room where we have access to a bunch of whiteboards and we can almost like teach each other what we've learned over the course of the week. And it's a great way for you to really be engaged in what you're learning. 
Um, we also have, we do still have those large group um, sessions to like solidify what we've learned in the small groups. Um, but it's a really great way of, I think, of them sort of changing the curriculum from a traditional standpoint. In addition, you can see on Tuesday, we had like an epidemiology class. So it's not just all sciences, we're also learning, we're learning uh, things about public health, um, epidemiology, um, sort of different like points about patient communication, social determinants of health. Hofstra does a great job of integrating these different components that you will encounter as a doctor um, into the curriculum. Um, and it's, it's, it's really terrific. Um, and then finally, anatomy lab. Um, that's a once a week occurrence for us. And um, the, really, the thing I like about anatomy is that it's really hands-on. And it's again, it's, it's structured in a small group setting that I think not many medical schools in the past used to do. Um, and I'll give you guys a, more of a taste of that later. So is there time for fun? That is, I think a myth. This is a myth that I'm gonna address actually here um, because the answer is yes, we do have fun. Um, for example, in the, in the course of my day, sometimes my friends and I, we play spike ball outside the school. I love spike ball. It's like one of my new hobbies now. Um, we play Super Smash Bros in the student lounge sometimes. And maybe if those two activities aren't what you like, if you're more of an intellectual, there are a bunch of puzzles in the library that some of us do to pass the time. So the answer is yes, there is opportunity for fun in med school. It's not just being in the classroom and studying all day. Um, yeah, so this is basically, this is, I was gonna ask this to be like more of an inter interactive thing. Um, in the chat, if you guys can write which image best describes your preferred learning style. So do you, and there's no right or wrong answer. Do you prefer a, like a lecture with um, a professor like using a PowerPoint to teach it you guys? Or do you prefer like a small group setting where students are just like talking amongst themselves and there's like a facilitator in the room? So let's see. The chat's definitely going wild. Uh, at okay. first, it looked like there were mostly the small group, and then there were some some one picture one thrown in there. So it looks okay. like there is a bit of a mix. Um, cool. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. A lot that's of kind of what I expected. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of what I expected actually. A little bit of a mix. I thought maybe it'd be skewed a little more towards the small group because I find that students nowadays are more sort of into into small group learning. Um, I would probably put myself in picture two as well. Okay, so I drew this arrow here because I'm trying to demonstrate that this is kind of a growing trend, in my opinion, um, in medical education, where there's more of, uh, more of a movement towards the smaller group structure. And I think um, our school was one of the first schools to kind of really be open to this change. And I think there, there have been a lot of schools so far that have tried to like observe us and they've been sort of seeing if they want to make those same changes and implement them at their own institutions. So I think it's, it's a really cool trend. And I'm really excited that we're like on the frontiers of this um, in terms of changing medical edu education for the future. Exams, what about exams? Um, the great thing is that they're pass fail in the first two years. Um, and I can't even like understate how important that is because Initially, like as a pre-med, you're so used to grades, right? You're so used to like saying of like, get, let me get, like, I want to get the A. In medical school, that gets thrown out, like thrown out the window completely because for the first two years, it's pass fail. We don't even get a score on our exams. It's, it's actually just like a green and a yellow light system. Um, so there's really no room for like comparing yourself to other people. And you're just essentially seeing if you pass or not. And I think that has made my stress levels go down so much, and I think it's a great like change that medical schools have made over time. Um, we still have like formative, like formative meaning that it's not officially graded, but it's more for your feedback. Um, we do have, we still have weekly assignments to test our understanding of knowledge. Um, and exams only happen at the end of every block, which is a block usually runs for about two to three months. And the great thing is we're not as stressed during the block because we only have that one exam week at the end. Um, where we're studying a lot, but for the rest of the block, we're free to explore other things. Um, clubs and interests, groups, you can always go on the website to look at stuff. Um, just briefly, some of the things that I got involved in were um, a mentoring program with um, younger students in our local community, uh, where we teach them about sort of like healthy habits and healthy living. 
as well as I got involved with um, this really cool like podcast actually that's part of our school where um, it's it's an attending physician his name's Dr. Nash he talks about um, or he try he brings a lot of guest lecturers on from Northwell Institution and he talks about sort of like a lot of a lot of it has been COVID recently but it's also about like healthy behaviors and whoever's listening can like can learn from this which is great um, so I've been part of like helping him with the discussion guides for that. And that's been really rewarding. Research. Um, research is amazing at our school. I think there's so many opportunities for, for students that wanna do research. Um, on top of the fact that Northwell has so many private uh, principal investigators, um, there's, that there's definitely something for you, no matter what in what area of medicine you're interested in doing research. So I put like two pictures of the Feinstein, Feinstein Institute, as well as Cold Spring Harbor, which is really located in a, in a beautiful area of uh, Long Island. Um, and I have a couple of classmates actually that are doing research at Cold Spring this summer. Um, and then I was gonna talk a little bit more about my current summer research. So I mentioned before, um, I'm really interested in this field of neurosurgery. So I am interested in neurosurgery, um, by the way. Um, I've always been sort of centered in on the brain since my undergraduate years. Um, but there's an area of neurosurgery called functional neurosurgery that I find like absolutely fascinating, where these surgeons and neurologists um, and physicians are basically working in like manipulating the nervous system and certain nerves in the body. And they're able to, they were able to come up with a bunch of like different devices that help stimulate these nerves. Um, that can be oftentimes a very crucial like palliative measure that can help reduce, reduce patients' um, symptoms of pain. Um, it's currently being used a lot in the field of um, things with like neurodegenerative disorders, epilepsy, which is what I'm specifically researching, um, as well as some neuropsychiatric stuff and movement disorders. So I think it's it's a field that's like still very, it's still being explored. So there's a lot of room for innovation here. And what I'm currently doing is again, a clinical study with a pediatric neurosurgeon at Northwell, um, looking to see if there are any change in outcomes for these newer models of vagus nerve stimulators um, that have this cool thing called heart rate monitoring capacity. So in other words, these newer models, like you can see the Aspire um, on this, this little picture here, they can actually detect if a patient has a higher heart rate than, than baseline. And research has shown that higher heart rates are often associated with, with seizures or the onset of a seizure. So it's another way of like, um, serving as a checkpoint to immediately shoot stimulation when that seizure is about to come and prevent any bad outcomes for the patient. Um, so I'm currently seeing whether or not there's a significant um, decrease in seizure frequency with these newer models that have this heart rate monitoring program. Um, but I'm sure the other, the other physicians, the other neurosurgeons that you'll talk to will talk about their exciting research and there is so much that you can um, explore. And I'm really excited for you guys that you're gonna get a, get a taste of this this summer. Um, my favorite part of medical school so far, I think the, the thing I would, would have said would, would be this thing we called ICE, which is the initial clinical experience. Um, and it's unique to our first and second year students where they allow us for once a week to go into various different sites in uh, the Northwell Health System. And you can see all the sites listed in this map. Um, and we're able to work with a, with a mentor or preceptor and we directly help them with like patient care. So we're asked to sort of satisfy a series of like clinical objectives. So it's not just passive learning, but it's more like you're taking an active role in, in your learning. And I think it's been so nice because my preceptors have been great and I've been able to learn so much more about the field um, through these experiences. And I feel like there, there are so many days I come in where I've learned something in the classroom that I can now, that I, that I see eventually in the clinic and um, because it's so fresh in my head, sometimes I jump in and like I can impress my preceptor um, by knowing these things. And it's, it's really awesome. So I, I hope a lot of other medical, medical schools also do this, if not already most, um, because I think it's a really formative part of the first, first two years of medical school. I wanted to also just add this, like, again, if you are not maybe as interested in pursuing a, a medical degree, um, there are so many other professions in the healthcare field. So oftentimes people opt for maybe becoming a physician assistant because there's less years of training, it's less expensive. Um, 
You could also become like a nurse practitioner or a nurse, registered nurse, um, physical therapist, home health aide. There are so many fields in medicine and I can't overstate enough that medicine is a team. So for example, if you're in the operating room, the operating room, I never knew this before, but now since I'm going, um, you'll have many people in the room with you. It's not just the surgeon. You'll have an anesthesiologist. You'll have a scrub tech that's handing the surgeon the instrument. Um, you'll have a circulating nurse that's going to be responsible for hand handling other um, things that the surgeons need. So this whole concept of a team is, is like crucial in medicine. And it's something I didn't really realize before I actually started medical school. Um, but it's, I think it's a good idea to like understand that there are other roles that people play in the hospitals um, and ultimately ensuring the best care for your patients is number one, but that can't be done without effective communication with the other members of your team. Oh, um, I had a video, but I think I'm not gonna show that just because for the sake of, um, I'd rather maybe answer questions, um, but you can always check, I can send out this PowerPoint um, if you wanna share it with them and you guys can check out that video. It's just, uh, um, it was sent from the uh, Office of Admissions from our school, so. Nice, Brendan, that was so well done. Um, super Thank helpful. Uh, and the chat was going wild the whole time. Um, so one thing I feel like I saw a lot um, that people were asking is like the idea of like medical schools these days seem to expect a lot. Like they want you to have research and clinical and have a good GPA, etc. cetera. Um, but then there's also that like, how do I balance that with like having a life at college? Um, and so I feel like maybe if you could talk a little bit more about how you went about that, like just this idea of like doing what you needed to do, but making sure you were like still a person at the end of the day. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's a great question. I think it's so important. Um, I think for me, the way I sort of went about it was I made sure that like I had enough time to, to be a person and to balance it. Um, and I think for, for me, a lot of times it was like relying on my friends. So I was in a fraternity in college actually. So if, if anyone's in, interested in like Greek life, for example, um, I will say you can 100% do pre-med and do Greek life um, if, you can, if you can balance it correctly. And I think for me, it was just making sure that I wasn't overloading myself. So like I said before, the, the summer of my first year, I had to drop a few things because I wanted to improve my grades. And that also kind of opened the doors for me to um, spend more time with friends or do other outside activities that made me happy. Um, so I think my advice for the students would be, don't be afraid to make changes to your current schedule if you feel like you want more time for your personal health and personal activities, because um, that's, that, that, that is a very important part of it. And ultimately, I want all you guys to be happy um, as you're going through this path because it's a very exciting path, but um, you want to keep that in mind because like, don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, you, you want to maintain your relationships and your mental health and everything like that. So again, don't be afraid to cut down if, if you need to um, and don't be shy about reaching out to people as well. Agreed. Definitely agreed there. Um, another thing uh let's see um people seem to be wondering like how you chose which medical schools to apply to um some are asking how many you don't have to answer that but like yeah how did you go about kind of figuring out where you wanted to be um for med school sure yeah i, I can also answer that I, I don't mind um so the way i kind of did it was first i i thought to myself about the criteria that were important to me about the medical school I wanted to choose. So number one, I think I wanted a school, well, first of all, I wanted a school that was closer to home. So I live in New Jersey. So um, I applied to schools mostly on the East Coast. I actually ended up applying to, I think 30 schools. Um, and there's no, there's no right or wrong number, um, but I would say like definitely apply to as many as you're capable of that you feel comfortable with. Um, so. I guess you can talk to your pre-med advisors more if you're having a question about number of schools based on your MCAT, GPA, et cetera. Um, but then I think for me, I wanted a school that maybe had a smaller class size. So there was more faculty devoted attention. Um, I love the fact that Northwell or Zucker School of Medicine had 
primarily small group learning. That was really important to me, as well as the fact that um, Northwell was such a big institution that I knew that I would have plenty of opportunities to shadow or to do clinical learning with a whole host of faculty um, in really any specialty that I wanted to. I think that was another major plus um, that, I, that I used to choose. At the end of the day, a lot of times it's gonna come down to, um, it may come down to financial aid for, for many students. Sometimes you'll be choosing between two similar schools, um, but one might be offering more money than the other. A lot of students tend to, to factor that in. Um, sometimes students take into account maybe like prestige or um, where uh, students have matched to. Um, this is also a, a very important point because um, if you're seeing at certain schools that students are matching to institutions that you want to end up at, um, then the school will likely be a, a good fit because it'll prepare you well for that. So um, that is another consideration to have. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's like a right or wrong in terms of the number. I think definitely given your means and how many you can apply to, I think applying to more might be better because of like the numbers game. But again, it is expensive still, just, just remember that and um, talk to your pre-med advisors. Come on, come on, Brandon, tell them the truth. You, you uh, came to Hofstra because brain turns. We all know, we all know Brandon. I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna be that you're obvious not, about you're it, not. obviously that was the, come the on, reason. Man. <laughs> Our special shirt today. Uh, yeah, I love it. Rep. <laughs> um, Dr. Langer, do you think we have time for one more? Yeah, keep going. Keep like, going. It's keep going. It's fine. Yes. All right, Brandon. I can stay on. So yeah. Um, no yeah. Problem. We do have we have our 10 a.m. lecture. Um, that's the only thing. Otherwise, I would try and keep you as long as possible. <laughs> um, <Nope. Yeah. laughs> but I feel like this would be a good one to end with. Um, so what do you feel makes made you and will make others like stand out on an application? Like in terms of they're applying to med school, what, what about their application is gonna like be like, we want this person. <laughs> and I feel like that would be a good one to end on. Yeah, actually I, I do have a, a response to that that just popped out into my head. Um, I think there's a way, admissions officers they have a way of knowing, I think, what like motivates you and what's your what's your passion. I think in the way that like you even write your answers to these questions. Um, I think what makes a student stand out is like how they talk about, how they discuss their experiences about the things they're passionate about. Um, this will come out in your interviews as well, where I think a very good thing to do is to like give stories or, or recount like tangible experiences of things that you did that you were passionate about and I think that really makes you stand out. So being more like specific in your application um, and in your interviews versus being more general, I think is a huge, um, is a huge point. Um, you can't emphasize the, you know, the activities that you've done, the hard work, the blood, sweat, and tears that you've put in into your, your extracurricular activities or your research or your volunteering um, enough. So, you know, Give, give, your, give yourselves credit and really sort of showcase it, um, show it off. Like, I think that that's a really important thing, no matter what it is. And again, like some people, I think a lot of times students tend to think like, oh, I need to satisfy the requirements. I need to check this box off, that box off. Um, and students try to hunt for that, especially on the forums or things like that. But at the end of the day, it's really about what drives you and what motivates you. And I think that will come out if it's genuine or not. Yeah, I, that's great. Um, I agree. Like it's passion that should come through. Um, and it definitely did for you, uh, in this lecture and just, it was really, really great to hear from you. Um, I, uh, I'll text you maybe about like, I don't know, like the PowerPoint and like other questions. I don't know if you have time. Uh, but yeah, I, we really, really appreciate you coming on and talking to everybody. Um, yeah, you're getting like a million thank you, thank you, thank you in the chat box. <laughs> thank, thank you, hey, Ashley. Hey, Brennan. Being here. Thanks, Thanks so much, guys. That was great. Um, this is going to be a, a really, I think, important session and segment that's going to recur for the next three weeks. Um, I don't know if everyone in the chat knows or not, or everyone listening, you know, these lectures go on YouTube uh, and they're free in their access for people who ha aren't able to attend this morning. And so you can go back and, and revisit. And then, Brendan, I, you know, Brandon, sorry, I wouldn't. Um, 
you know, if you're okay with it, you can always share your email with people with questions. Um, but be warned, there's over 12,000 people enrolled. <laughs> and so um, your inbox might get filled very, very quickly. I, I realize that. Um, yeah. what, what have people done in the past about it? Have they shared their emails or? Mixed bag, man. We can also convey messages to you. So don't be, don't worry about it. Maybe, maybe that'd be better if, if there's a very common yeah. question. If you guys or Ashley or someone can convey it to me. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Hey, did, uh, did, um, did you uh, make the, the big announcement about your changing your life, Randy? You can stop me? Sharing. No, I'm here with him right now. This yeah, is uh, baby the, last night. the, the ah. original Brain Turn 2.0. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, because I have another one. So he's he's taking a little nap right now. But I'm hanging out. So I, I'm obviously going to leave hey, Randy, this one. Randy, show me the, the baby boss. again. Randy, show me the baby again. Congratulations. There. Cool. You Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm super excited about the next lecture. Yeah, I'm super excited about the next lecture. Dr. Langer obviously will do the introduction. Um, but this is this is part of what makes this whole session uh, super special is hearing people also outside of medicine talking about you know their field and uh, and their passions and what made them successful. And so um, take it away. I'm going to listen on very closely. Brandon, do you mind unsharing your screen? I'm sorry. Um. Perfect. Okay. Thank you.